why hello and welcome everybody so today i wanted to go ahead and give you guys my top 10 tips for progressing on a league start with righteous fire inquisitor now if you're coming from my google sheets you'll notice that there is another top 10 tips in there some of these may be a bit uh overlapping and redundant uh, the sake of this video is to bring more attention to make sure people cannot really screw up their league start so with that being said let us talk about number one number one is pious path uh, pious path is the main entire essentially thing that we're building around with righteous fire so i want to go ahead and explain it so when you are around level 55 and you are ascending and you are converting yourself into righteous fire you will have pious path Essentially, what Pious Path means is you will have permanent consecrated ground as long as you are doing something to refresh it every couple of seconds. Also, I just thought for some reason Elder was on my map, but it's the Inquisitor's beard. That was kind of strange. Uh, so yeah, basically you have this consecrated ground here, and anytime you do any action that is not instant cast, it will refresh. This is why I put a big emphasis on walking with your shield charge. So walking with your shield charge is basically like so you pretty much just move every so often and you pretty much are aiming with your shield charge uh, a lot of people don't like doing this they feel their shield charge gets clipped a lot as an example you know trying to go up the stairs here in an instance like this we just frost blink right that actually didn't fix it but you get the point uh you don't have to do this you can move with flame dash you can do something every couple of seconds you can throw a fire trap but the number one most important thing is maintaining your consecrated ground if you don't have your consecrated ground up you will notice your ES will immediately drop and there is a chance your life will start dropping too. And this is all just from Pious Path. So just remember to make sure you are using something to maintain that. Uh, a lot of the time when you're bossing, you don't have to worry about it because you're gonna be like throwing a fire trap, going throwing a fire trap, etc. Okay, going into number two, which is going to be Frost Blink mechanics. So Frost Blink mechanics are pretty important and I wanna bring a lot of emphasis to this because I notice a lot of new players think that they cannot dodge if they play RF and they just have to go face. So I'm going to show you an example in a Maze of the Minotaur map here, essentially how to properly use your Frost Blink. So Minotaur is going to activate. He's going to go down. He pops up. He's going to look at me. I Frost Blink ahead of him. Again, Frost Blink to the other side. There is no reason to take unnecessary damage unless you want to take that unnecessary damage. Remember that when you use your Frost Blink on a unique target, it will gain cooldown recovery, and on top of cooldown recovery, it will create a chilled ground, which makes it easier to dodge mechanics. Furthermore, with our setup, we are using a Curse on Hit setup. So for example, when we use our Frost Blink, it will also apply Elemental Weakness, and because we landed on a target area, it also drops the Pious Path Consecrated Ground. So think of... For the, for the general sake of mapping, think as Frost Blink as your single target and think of Fire Trap as your boss deleter. You almost never need to throw Fire Traps when you're mapping unless you're doing instance and cap, not instance, but scenarios like an Essence Mob or maybe like a Red Beast or just things that are absurdly tanky compared to normal or situations where you're doing like Abyss uh, and you're waiting for monsters to pop up, then of course you could throw your Fire Traps. All right, number three, we're going to go into Atlas Mechanics. So uh, before I jump into all of the Atlas Mechanics, um, number three is also somewhat tied in with number five, which is talking about a war cry. So uh, let me go ahead and port back and show you. So for this sake, uh, I'm going to use Harvest as an example, as Harvest is one of my favorite league mechanics for crafting uh, gear. And you have two choices with your war cry. Uh, number one, you can either use Enduring Cry, or number two, you can use Infernal Cry. Remember that we do have Call to Arms allocated, so you only want to use one or the other. Of course, you can just have them in your inventory and swap when needed. So, utilizing Infernal Cry... Sorry, where, where actually are my War Cries? Are they here? Yeah. Utilizing Enduring Cry will give you an insane spike in regeneration. So you can see right now I have 1k regen with 1k regen. Hitting Infernal Cry puts me to 8k effective regeneration. Maybe after RF, it's like 7k. That's basically your life flask. If you pop that, you are full instantly. You are 100% full. Uh, I typically prefer to map with uh, Infernal Cry, and I will show you why. So when you are clearing in PoE and you don't have, say, your Legacy of Fury, you'll notice you don't do that much damage. 
Harvest is a great example of me trying to show this. So, in a harvest pack, you'll notice that a lot of mobs spawn, right? Well, as a lot of mobs spawn, you just press Infernal Cry, and then the mobs pretty much explode. And then you don't really have to worry. You can apply this same logic to running into a shrine, running into an abyss, running into a very thick corridor with just lots of monsters in general. Um, so I'll do it again and show you. Just throw some fire traps and Infernal Cry, and they die. That's it. An example of me clearing without Infernal Cry. Let me like pop this and... Might not look that much of, of a difference, but if you don't have as much gear, you're gonna do significantly less damage. And Infernal Cry scales off monster health. So even if you don't have as much damage, Infernal Cry will be a massive clear boost, I promise. Okay, going on to actual league mechanics of what Righteous Fire is good at. For the most part, you are good at every single league mechanic in the early game with the exception of Legion, Blight, and High Delirium percentages. Now, the reason why I'm talking about these three is number one, Legion. Legion is a, is a mechanic where it basically spawns a ton of monsters on your screen and you have X amount of time to clear them. If you don't have good damage or Legacy of Fury, you cannot really pop all the Legion monsters at once. When it comes to high delirium percentage, delirium just makes monsters have insane damage reduction and Righteous Fire is not one of the, it's it's like an average tier skill with its damage. It's not very high. You'd even consider it on the lower side of damage. So I wouldn't really try to clear delirium past like 40 to 60% unless you know what you're doing. Same thing applies to Simulacrum Wave 30. Granted, budget builds are not really going into Simulacrum. RF can be designed for it, but you get the point. The last one would be Blight, and the reason I talk about Blight is you don't have as much coverage uh, as, say, like a bow build or other variants. However, however, um, with the introduction of using Fire Trap, we now can pretty easily just throw Fire Traps at the Blight lanes. And to be fair, if you're utilizing Blight Towers, you should not really have an issue with it. That being said, I want to talk about the League mechanics I personally really like for Righteous Fire, and that would be Essence betrayal and harvest now these are not necessarily because of righteous fire but more so they help me craft my gear um you can essence craft majority of your gear i typically essence craft my uh my ring so this is an example of an essence of anger crafted ring you can see that percentage fire on it uh, we essence craft our helmet you can see i have the uh, 30 percent more ellie from the essence craft the body armor i crafted with an essence for the guaranteed high life roll um, so Essence is very, very impactful. When it comes to Betrayal, I'm going to flashbang you for a quick second really fast. So Betrayal, uh, on my goals list here, you can see a list of what I consider to be pretty good for Righteous Fire, which is the Life as ES here, which you can find on my body armor. You can see this Life as ES right here um, is giving me 700... 800 ES, 900 ES actually even. It's very, 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 very big um, just for having that mod on there. You also have the plus one AOE gems, which I don't have on this character at the moment. That would go on your helmet or your gloves. You've got the 3% life regen that you can get on your flask, which is very big and you know, such. I'm not gonna go into everything. You guys have access to that. So talking about some other things, I wanna talk about righteous fire mechanics. So. Speaking of Righteous Fire mechanics, there is a reason why we put emphasis on wanting... I know this sounds, sounds kind of dumb, but there's a reason why you don't want to just rush your map tier and go straight to tier 16 on day one of the league. You want to make sure you have a nice even progression ceiling to the point of where your Righteous Fire is instantly killing all white monsters. If your RF is instantly killing all white monsters, and even in like... Uh, as an example, if I put in, I'll go put in like a tier 16 map, the chances of you getting hit by those monsters significantly decreases. When the chances of you getting hit significantly decreases, you automatically are quite a bit more tanky when you're ruling out majority of monsters trying to hit you in PoE. Then for mobs that are a bit more tanky, you have things like Infernal Cry or Frost Blink that you can jump on top of. So an example would be, you know, going through this tier 16 map, you'll notice most of the mobs don't really get to hit me. Because they don't hit me, they can't really do damage. Now, granted, we're not a glass cannon build, but you really should utilize the Ring of Righteous Fire as a defensive layer, as it truly is a defensive layer on top of everything else. 
Okay. Some other things about Righteous Fire you want to know. Um, I get this question a lot. Righteous Fire does not hit. Because it does not hit, it cannot leech. Because it does not hit and it does not leech, it cannot be reflected. The only time you'll ever have an issue with reflect is if you're using a leveled frost blink. Personally, I'd recommend using a level one. The cooldown recovery is still fine. And then you won't have to worry about reflect. Okay, uh, moving on. Since we already talked about the war cries, we're going to talk about guard skill. This one is pretty brain dead. It's very simple. Um, you have two options for your guard skill. You can run into cast one damage taken setup, but I don't have enough sockets, so I just put it on left click. What that simply means is you literally put your guard skill molten shell on left click, and as you are walking around your map, it will automatically apply. So as long as you're not holding left click and then losing your consecrated ground, right? So I just move with shield charge for the most part, and then your guard skill will automatically go off. Another one. Uh, getting your first six link um, in recent times six linking has become so much easier with access to much more divination cards drop rates being adjusted what i recommend you do is purchase an emperor of purity emperor of purity is this divination card here you can farm it in ssf it's a bit of a pain in the ass but it is very much manageable you can buy it in trade league granted if the price of this skyrockets there will be alternate methods but for now i'm going to go with the emperor of purity for about five leagues in a row, Emperor of Purity has not went past four chaos on day one. Maybe, maybe it went to five, but usually it's around three chaos. Dex requirements. So this is mainly for the leveling phase and even kind of the end game transition. So leveling, uh, leveling phase for dex, you have the following options. There is a dex node right here by agility when we are pathing towards acrimony. This is still when we're winter tide brand. You have the two-point option of getting precision for dex, attack speed, and cast speed. You have another option of getting dex all the way down here with proficiency. Don't forget, you can still get dexterity on like your gloves, even if they're not evasion-based. You can get dex on your rings, Ashes of the Star, which is not really beginner, that comes later. But anyway, it has an all attributes role. Uh, furthermore, there's a brutal restraint that I like to use on my build. Um, it was not, it's not really something you're going to get day one, but later on in the future is something you can swap out potentially like a dex node for an actual brutal restraint. Flasks. This is a very, 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 very big part of the build. I cannot emphasize enough about the importance of your flasks. When you are playing a squishy build that's range that is off screening it's not nearly as important but as we're playing a build that is running melee into everything's face you want to make sure you have the correct flask setup now when it comes to the correct flask setup it's really up to you but the two i would recommend that are not really changeable is your ruby and your granite um, sometimes you can replace granite for basalt depending on your armor value it's very easy to check you just click the flask and see what gives you more so speaking on the topic of flasks i want to explain one nice thing about righteous fire with flasks you'll notice on my flasks that here we go you'll notice that my flasks are automatically going off with the exception of the chemist sulfur so the reason why the flasks are going off automatically is because i put a very big emphasis on the prefix of your flask the prefix on your flask implying gain x charges when you are hit by an enemy if you look at the charge counter you can pretty much just see it going out of control now what this means is anytime you are hit by an attack by a spell your flask gains charges so if you're able to effectively face tank your target aka certain map most map bosses most mapping situations your flask will always be active what I personally recommend is number one, securing your gain charges when you are hit and then worrying about your suffix. Example, in my opinion, it's much better to have 100% uptime on your Quicksilver than say have 50% uptime because you have a good suffix, right? What I mean by a good suffix is my Quicksilver has 53% increased armor, right? But if you didn't have gain charges when hit, then maybe you would not be able to automate this 100%, thus only gaining some value from your flask. Now, this is again just my opinion. It's important to kind of play the way you want. 
So I want to also talk about some suffixes on your flasks and then of course how to get your use when charges reach full. So number one, some very good suffixes for your flasks would be 53% increased armor during flask effect. This has many rolls. You can specifically see here, this is a tier two roll. Uh, the difference between me having the increased armor and a granite flask on is pretty big. So if I go to the high or to the side here, you'll notice I have 60,000 armor that drops down to 52,000 that then drops down to 36,000. That's the difference between me having my granite my Quicksilver, and my Molten Shell. Very big difference on the flasks, or from the flasks. Furthermore, there is also the Regenerate X amount of life per second. This is only unveiled through Katarina, so you will not have it right away. Other than that, that, those are pretty much your two main suffixes. There's a lot of extra fluff suffixes, but these I would say are the most important. Number one being the armor value. Okay. So to understand how to roll these flasks, it's pretty simple. Step one, you're going to get a flask. The higher the item level, the better, but it's not required because even if you have gained four charges when you're hit, you're good to go. Simply put, when you're ready to invest currency, just buy a higher item level flask. So let's take a ruby flask and let's go ahead and start with the four baubles. Boom. Nothing. Roll again. Roll again. Bam. There's gain five charges when you are hit. Now, the only problem I would say with this flask is that it has less duration on it. So, a null orbs, depending on the league you're in, could either A, be a couple chaos, B, maybe they're a lot more expensive, C, maybe they're like one or two chaos. So, you could straight up annul the suffix and see if you get lucky. In this case, I did not. We can roll again. So, this has a suffix and uh, the gain charges when hit is a prefix. So, I would use an augment here to see if you get lucky. There's a gain seven charges. Let's roll again. Is that suffix? That is suffix. Another gain six charges. From here, all you really have to do is go to your hideout. And I think this is when you use the instilling orbs, which you will not have maybe right away but you will easily gain access to these from just playing the game and here you can see the used when charges reach full and it's right there for you and then you're good to go why not keep seven charges because i was just showing an example of rolling your flask on how easy it is to get it that's all number 10 is going to be the aura choice so in my build I pretty much have not really changed my auras up for I would say the past like two leagues really. It has pretty much always been Malevolence, Determination, Purity of Elements, Defiance Banner, and then when you get in Ashes of the Stars and you can anoint Charisma, you can fit in your Skitterbots. I want to talk about the importance of each of these auras. Remember this is not covering Aegis Aurora variant. Aegis Aurora Melding of the Flesh is not a friendly league starter, which is why we're not really putting emphasis on it at this current point in time so let's go ahead and talk about it number one being the first one we typically turn on is purity of elements purity of elements gives us a massive amount of uh, elemental resistance furthermore while providing immunity to freeze chill shock uh ignite brittle sap and scorch i am bad at counting so um let's talk about that if you notice, if I turn off my purity of elements, my res will drastically drop. One other thing to pay attention to that a lot of people forget is resistance in recent times has been very, very flexible. What I mean by that is if you look at my ring, for example, this is a ring that has 69% increased damage. The 69% increased damage from the 30 LE with the 39% fire would not normally be achievable in this current state because I would be lacking res from pure without using purity of elements. So purity of elements gives a lot of flexibility on your gear crafting, allowing you to basically go more aggressive with your gearing choices. Now, of course, this could be dot multi. This could be a, a, a culmination of things. Uh, I was just trying to simply make a point with how resistance can be very interchangeable with what you use. Okay, uh, talking about the next aura, determination. Determination is the bread and butter to basically playing a build that is going to soak up damage. If I were to say, turn off my determination, my armor is going to go from 36,000 to, I really guess 
like 12k? Oh, that's purity of elements. I'm gonna guess 12k. Okay, not even 12k. We're at a whopping 7,000 armor. If I pop all my flasks, we're at 15,000. Do you remember our previous value that we had at 59,000? That is how much of a difference your determination makes. Furthermore, the determination armor scaling complements your molten shell, providing you with a bigger buffer of health, as you can see here. Okay, going into the next one, we have Malevolence. Malevolence is your one very aggressive aura that you run uh, for damage, with the exception of Skitterbot, but that comes later. So Malevolence is my personal choice because it grants us a multiplier to our skill effect duration. And actually, it's not a multiplier skill, it's increased skill effect duration. 21% more damage over time. So if we were to just look at my Fire Trap tooltip as an example, it does around uh 800k burn oh i don't have rf on there we go it does 1.1 million burn damage per second if i were to remove malevolence it drops down to 846k not to mention the skill effect duration applies to your molten shell for how long the buff lasts it also applies to how long the burning ground on your fire trap lasts which is just like quality of life you can see there it says duration is 2.28 seconds if i turn it off it goes down to 1.75 Skitterbots from Ashes of the Stars. Now, the reason why we uh, run Skitterbots via Ashes of the Stars and why I don't like running it before, the whole, like, I don't like running it before, you could choose to not run Malevolence and run Skitterbots if you like. I prefer to have Malevolence because it feels smoother to clear. Sometimes I notice the Shock Skitterbot gets a little stupid and runs in a corner, and then at which case it's not shocking targets over here, whereas Malevolence is just permanently on. I don't have to deal with, you know, AI of whatever this thing is doing in the corner right there um right but anyway talking about skitterbot so skitterbot is pretty cool because number one it gives you two multipliers it gives you shock which is increased damage taken on targets which is a multiplier to all of your sources of damage and then it grants more trap and mine damage fire trap is a trap so it basically double dips for a 35 percent reservation while still adding chill to anything that's not being chilled from your actual frost blink that pretty much covers everything uh one more tag i want to explain why i don't run purity of fire um a lot of people say if their elemental resistance is fine can they just drop purity of elements and run purity of fire i'm gonna tell you um no thank you chat for the banner um, no, I would not recommend dropping Purity of Elements for Purity of Fire. And the reason being is, yes, when you run your Purity of Fire, you may have an extra 3 to 5 max Fire Res, but you're giving up your immunity to Brittle, Sap, Scorch, Shock, Freeze, Chill, and Ignite. Um, the only time I would recommend running Purity of Fire over Purity of Elements is if you're a little bit more experienced and you understand how to deal with elemental ailments and you're trying to set up a Melding of the Flesh variant. Um, that is not utilizing Aegis Aurora. Aegis Aurora um, typically is paired with Purity of Ice when you go Melding of the Flesh. Which is not a League starter. It's kind of expensive. Okay, uh, moving on from there, there is one other aura I forgot to mention. I kind of neglected it, and it's really, really good. That would be your Defiance Banner. Defiance Banner pairs really, really well with Determination, and the reason why is let's just look at the baseline tooltip. Determination grants more armor. Defiance Banner, you have increased armor. So we get flat armor plus more armor from Determ with percentage armor scaling from our Defiance Banner, which all just synergizes together very, very well. Anyway, that should pretty much conclude everything that I could possibly tell you guys. Um, for now, for League Starting Righteous Fire, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them down below or just hit up the exclamation mark RF command in my stream for the document. That's pretty much about it. I wish you guys a wonderful league start for 3.18. Feel free to hop by the stream at twitch.tv slash pox. Uh, I cannot wait to see you guys. Normally, I don't stream on Sundays, but for league start, I make an exception. So we should have a lot of fun this league. Anyway, see you guys all later. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.